I am in the Mojave Desert on the December solstice. You know me, I like a good high holy day hierophany. And we're going out to a site where, according to research, um, we can see the sun interact with petroglyphs and a natural rock feature on the solstice. Now, um, What's really cool about this place is it was occupied, well, the, this, this calendar alignment situation we're gonna see was um, created probably around the year 200 CE and was likely in use ever since. The cultures connected with it are even cooler is that uh, we have the Mojave, we have the Southern Paiute, and we also have the, um, the Southwesterners proper, the, what you call uh, ancestral Pueblo and Hohokam even, because the culture areas were so fluid. And where I am right now in the Mojave Desert is a really well-known trade route between the interior and the Pacific coast. Also, there are turquoise mines around here. So people from the Four Corners region, for example, that area of the Southwest would come into this little tip of um, Southern Nevada to mine turquoise. So th this, this, ha this is a really fluid area full of a lot of different cultures all from the Southwest, which means that they shared over a large period of time, they shared and traded ideas, um, religious practices, symbolism that you can see in the rocks. And these common themes repeat throughout these, these wide, um, I guess you call cultural interaction borderlands. It's not really, borders aren't really the right word for the kind of lifestyle those people led, but just for the sake of speaking English in this context, um, borderland is a good way to put it. So I guess between cult overlapping culture areas. What else can I say about that? Uh, I don't know. Let's get there and see what we got. Oh my goodness. I should have gotten here so much earlier. I was dilly-dallying. Look, this is what we're looking at. Look at this. Okay, these lights are playing upon these petroglyphs at the December solstice. Oh, I wish I would have been here earlier. I might have to come tomorrow. This is going to make me crazy if I don't see the whole thing. But up here, we've got this, um, this hole. There are these cupules pecked. Let me see if I can get my. So there we go. Got the selfie stick up in there. Um, there are all these cupules in here, which that beam of light is coming from the sunset. But the thing is, I was thinking sunset in terms of sunset, but this is only midday. I'm only here at like 12:30 p.m. That is something interesting, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, let's see. Let's get the lay of the land here. We've got that alcove, that alcove. Um, I've got some smooth stone right here next to my hat. Just look around. I saw petroglyphs over that way. There's some more little caves over that way. But right now, because I know Something's happening now. We're going to stay here and see what's going on. All right, you see how the sun's just there? Oh, I think I just missed it. I think I showed up to just miss it. Either that or it's going to start peeking out between those rocks pretty quick. I know I'm looking at this from the right spot because now this is really fun. All right. Um, this is the I got my GoPro sitting up there time lapsing with what's happening up there. But um, in the meantime, this is where we just were, all right? 
And right outside this, this cave is, this little structure, is what's called a heel stone. I'll give proper credit to where I learned all of this um, later. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I will put it somewhere on the screen right now. That's a heel stone. And what that means is, that's the view, place from which you view what's going on here. See how it's rough on this side? And it's very smooth on this side? That's from hundreds of years of people's feet. The heel going right there. While you kneel and watch what's happening right there. The sun is going to pass right around in there pretty quick. Okay, I'm standing at the heel stone and I have recreated the photo in the um, archaeology paper written by Merle Walker. And this is exactly where he shows to be standing. So um, I think the time is around 1.20 p.m. And he's saying that around 1.45 p.m. I should see the sun come through the cleft there show up in full at the cleft, so we'll see what happens. So here's something that's kind of easy to overlook, but I'll tell you, this is something that would only happen on this day, on the solstice, or, you know, solstice is a two week period, but um, you see how this shelter, this whole cove, it, alcove is, uh, is being rimmed with this light right here. That can't happen any other time of the year. The angle of the sun will only rim this, um, you know, this portal, this curvature on this day. And then remember in, when we got here, this was a little snake of light, like a little spear, and now it's turning into a big snake of light that's uh, traversing across the surface and crossing all of these petroglyphs that are etched into this, or I don't know what you say, carved into this rock here. It'll be interesting to watch the progression of that. Hmm. I don't, don't want to step on these, but look at all of this stuff surrounding that right there. That one has a story, which I'll tell you in a little while. That one might have a story, <laughs> which I'll tell you in a little while. This whole thing has a story, <laughs> which I'll tell you in a little while. Right now we're just looking. All these petroglyphs, let's see what's happening over here. I'm extending my stick, so I don't have to walk around up there. All along the mouth of this, look at all this imagery, or these, yeah, this imagery, these carvings. back at my heel stone and the sun is about halfway out. See, when I just go a little bit to the right, you can see the full sun. Um, it doesn't quite capture it in the camera, but to my eye, the sun is trying to peek in that little crevice right there. Oh, this is so exciting. So <laughs> with the crevices right next to that hole and next to this other little um, petroglyph, uh, I don't know, you know, panel. Um, but it's coming. Oh, this is really exciting. So we've got a few minutes before the sun passes right into that notch behind me. So I'm going to tell you why this, this site juices me up so much. Um, okay, where to start? Well, first of all, so a, a site like this, the reason it's exciting to me is because it rep the, the, the research around it represents the rewriting of history in a really positive way. Okay, so um, early on in archaeology, people who would research sites like this would say things like, um, 
this is how we could know when the winter solstice was coming. And that is not exactly how it would work. Everybody knows when the winter solstice is coming. You can, if you live outside, you can tell by where the light is going, rising and uh, falling every day on the landscape. We, you know when it's winter, you know when it's you, the sun, no matter where you live, you look at the, the, um, where the sun is setting each day and you remember from every single year of your life exactly where the sun um, you know, what, set on a given day of the year. So it's not a big mystery when's the solstice. What's important is celebrating the solstice. Now, why is the winter solstice uh, an important day in the Southwest? Well, to the um, Southwesterners, and I kind of assume this is a, a universal thing, but I am not, you know, educated on the world's religions per se, um, but I do know about the North American Southwest. So in the Southwest, and Mesoamerican culture in general, the um, the sun sets at its at its most. I had to think about how the Earth is tilted. Okay, so here's how it is: the Earth is tilted um, away from the sun the most in the winter. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, brain. Um, so the sun, as it's as it you know, as winter is falling, you're getting shorter and shorter days. The sun appears to be falling off, falling away. And we're worried that the sun won't return. We're, we're worried that if we haven't lived right lives, that the sun will just keep going further and further and the world will get colder and colder and our plants will never have plants and we'll never have warmth and everything will die. That's what the gods might do to us if we haven't practiced right lives throughout the year. So, um, ooh, what's happening here? And so um, we, this is one of those days, you know? Let's draw a hat. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you come to a solstice site and you perform the ceremony to the gods, to the, the god of the sun, to the god of fire, and um, honor that the sun is progressing and you're watching and you're waiting and you're hoping that you'll be answered with the sun going more northerly on the horizon as um you know the year the year progresses i'm gonna stop talking for a second and check this and there it is okay <laughs> we're standing at the cleft exactly where we should be on the heel stone let's show that heel stone again at the heel stone all right that's where you should be standing right about here is the eye line up there is the cleft and there's the sun it did it <laughs> exactly on time just as promised i keep moving around a little bit so it keeps the camera you know does its thing isn't that exciting this is it, it. this is the moment when the sun is piercing the earth in our ceremonial um let's call it a womb and i'll tell you why we'll call it a room womb in just a second but the sun is piercing the earth the sun is masculine the earth is feminine so when you find a place where the two come together that's um it's like the sun impregnating the earth with the warmth it needs to uh you know to reproduce all the foods and the people and the things that we need even rain can be built into that story this is so exciting this is the this only happens on the winter solstice so any other time of the year the sun wouldn't be on the right place on the horizon for this to happen. Oh, look at that. Oh my gosh. So as the sun reached its, its zenith point there, there at the, the V, when the, the, at the highest point of that moment, this has already disappeared. And you know what else has disappeared? The sun up in its little cove up in here. So, um, the author of that research that I was talking about mentioned the sun touching each of these lines along this, this carving. You see these look the kind of like arrows or something. Maybe it's a person, I don't know, but, um, and then you've got these lines. What he explained is that there were at one point six lines here. Now there's seven and that it seems like a line has been added to account for a shift in the Earth's crust. So this was used over a long period of time 
And in the interval of that time, the, the crest of the earth shifted ever so slightly to need to amend that. Oh, I wish I'd been here when it, it happened that you could see the light there, but that's okay. We saw a lot of really nice things. Oh, and the light is a certain way that you can see these petroglyphs much better now. All right, I'm gonna blah blah for a couple more seconds, a couple more minutes at <laughs> this site, and then um, we'll move on because while I was waiting for the light, I, I pe pecked around all around here and there's so much more to see that I really wanna show you that's so cool. Some really, really kind of epic things. So um, why I was saying that history is being rewritten in a better way is because now people are writing about sites like solstice calendars, not as calendars per se, but as ceremonial sites. So whereas people used to think, oh, we needed to rely on some kind of writing to know when, when the solstice is, like maybe we, we modern Westerners do, um, these people didn't need a calendar to tell them when it was. They used a place to celebrate when it happened, um, honor it, celebrate, I don't know if that's the right word, but in, in some way uh, do a ceremonies related to it. And I, I explained what that is. Okay, so um, right there, that image that I told you about before. Let's see if I can get a little closer to it. You see that? Um, it looks like a vagina with a penis going through it sideways and then like rain coming from it. So the short version of that story is there is a um, there is a story that's kind of a, a pan Yudo Aztecan story, uh, it, it, meaning uh, the Yudo Aztecans are the ones Yudo Nawa is the way we should be saying it, but um, who are the the main occupants of the Southwest? That's a language family, and throughout their stories, there's kind of a um, uh, it's I want to say it's a little bit uh, like an immaculate conception story which I think is probably closer to, and I don't want to step on anybody's uh, feelings when I'm talking about Christianity, but probably the origins of that Christianity story came from uh, more uh, ancient roots that sound more like this story. Okay, so what this is, is it, uh, it's the woman, the lone woman being impregnated by the sun to create the rain. It's a. It's not meant to be amongst humans. It's meant to be a creation story. It's meant to be something like, um, you know, the earth being impregnated with the sun's rays and creating the rain. And we just talked about that as being uh, what we just saw. That was the hierophany we just saw where the sun is piercing the earth. So um, that happens on days like this. Um, I'll return to that in a minute. So this one here, you see that it looks like a flower? Possibly, I don't know for sure, but this is kind of drawing on some other um, research about stories that are common in the Southwest. There's this story of, um, I don't know if she's archeologist, anthropologist, ethnologist, whatever she was, Jane Hill, researcher, scholar. She did a, a, a research paper about ancient roots of a story or of a flower world the yudo aztecans early early on like maybe eight thousand years ago um deep into antiquity shared this story about a flower world and that that imagery shows up in their stories it's not been really proven that it shows up in rock art but that does clearly look like a flower it doesn't mean it is a flower but it's interesting because somebody would look at that and maybe make that interpretation. So there's that. That's actually kind of an unusual shape to find um, in this region. So it might not actually be a flower or it could be newer. Uh, all right, and now I wanted to tell you about something. I'm gonna turn the camera around. 
All right, this is like big picture stuff, and this is really cool. This is actually something that I've learned about recently. Um, portals. A researcher named Stoffel, he does a lot of work with the Paiute. And the Paiute are Udo Aztecan. They're the Numic branch. They're the ones that come from the Great Basin region. And they um, they are related to the Shemuevi who would have been here um, closer to the historic period, like when Europeans were arriving, sort of at the late prehistoric period. Um, anyway, amongst their stories, so presumably amongst, it, oh gosh, I'm trying to figure out how to say this in the shortest way. Portals are a thing in Mesoamerican and the Udo Aztecan world in general as places where the, the there's interdimensional communication okay so um okay yeah and so that's where you can speak to the spirits or the portal opens up for you to move your mind interdimensionally into those spaces to receive teachings all right so Stoffel does work with the Paiute and the Paiute have shown him that uh the portals like arches like out in you know arches national monument or something in, like in utah those are portals things like these are portals these are highly sacred spaces where people can um unlock the portal pass through energetically and enter into the spirit realm and likewise the spirit realm can go the other way now I'm going to show you something that is commonly, and this is what oh, I'm so geeking out on this right now. All right, so this is a portal. We know we saw it. We we watch the sun come through it. This is a solstice portal. The sun interacts with this here. The sun pierces and impregnates this hole, um, just like it's indicated in this story right here. And at a and the Paiute point out, and the Paiute point it out, but it doesn't mean it's unique to the Paiute. The Paiute point out keyholes to portals. Keyholes are things like this, where you put your finger in and you sing and you chant and you put your finger in the keyhole and it opens up the portal. And it looks like there's another one up here. Now these are, cause look at this, this is a, this is a natural hole, rough. It's very rough. These are natural cupules, very, very rough. This could be natural or it could not be natural, but in either case, it's very smooth, very smooth. Look at that, it's rubbed smooth. Um, in the Paiute say that you, they put some grease and some pigment on their finger and put it into a portal like that. I de-stretched it, I don't see any pigment in there, but it doesn't mean there wasn't grease or something else on the hand um, that when you put it in, it, it rubs it smooth, it kind of lacquers it. This one too is very, very smooth. I'll show you something else. There appears to be red pigment all around this um, and sort of all around that area. It's very faint. This rock also has some reddish tint to it. So when you de-stretch it, there are some reddish tints in, in the natural features of the rock. Like I think a lot of this is natural, not red pigment, but you can see a slightly change of color happening up here. See, it kind of looks more pink right now. And over here, you see it even clearer. Look at this. All around the portal is red and black paint up here. And there's some up there. Um, could be smoke, but there's definitely red paint there. You can tell, you can see it with the naked eye and I'll de-stretch it in a second. And where did I just see that? Oh, right above me, I think. Where did I see it? Oh, here's another one. Look at that. Red and black paint right on that really smooth edge. I don't want to touch it, but I'm going to point to it. It's very smooth right there where that pigment is. Um, and I thought that right above me, there was another pictograph here. Did I miss it? Oh, there it is. Yeah. That's another. Um, it looks like a line with lines hanging down. The Paiute called that knotted string. Knotted string is a whole other topic that I want to get into another time, not right now. But what it means is that the southern Paiute slash Shemuevi could have brought this plus 
the keyhole idea into this um, portal that was already here, that was already celebrated as such since, like I said, around the year 200, but came and used it at a certain point and, and added these features if they weren't here already. And look how smooth this is. It's so smooth, it's shiny. And it makes me think that somebody took their hand and just, you know, people were wiping it, rubbing it, anointing it even with something over hundreds of years because that's just crazy smooth. I, I, unless somebody just came along and, and painted it in historic times, which I, it doesn't seem the case because this doesn't seem to be a very, um, this doesn't seem to be a very already destroyed site. But yeah, and look, see down in the petroglyphs, the carvings, it's not, it's not smooth like that. Like it wasn't like somebody came and spray painted this or something, I hope, unless this is land management repairing some kind of graffiti. Oh, I hope not. But um, anyway, I wanted to point that out because that's, that's something really cool that I've recently been learning about. Um, let's de-stretch that paint right there. So moving on from that one over to the little alcove next door, we've got some more pictographs. We've got another knotted string. Hmm, some extra strings kind of coming out to the sides. Unidentifiable, those look like squiggly lines though. Um, oh, they might be fingerprint dots. Yeah, some red that can't really tell what it is. Petroglyph, which is probably much older than the pictographs. Again, the Shemawivi may have brought those those pictographs. I can't say for sure though. Although the knotted string motif is common in the Numic speaker, amongst the Numic speakers, but maybe that's not a knotted string. Maybe that is something more like a tiered cosmos. And I can say that because I'm going to take you to see something else, which is amazing, that talks about the tiered cosmos. Are you ready? So this place was explained to be, there it is, <laughs> by Walker, a ceremonial site. Um, so a ceremonial complex. And what I wanted to show you is, see, this is the grander landscape. Let me touch the camera. There you go. See, it's a kind of a, a broad... Mm, flood basin. There's a lot of washes down in here. Um, a lot of this Mojave Desert area over time would have wet periods and dry periods. So uh, th there would be like, you know, a hundred year period or more where there would be heavy rains and the basins would fill and become shallow lakes and become home to a lot of um, marshland creatures and plants so people would move into the area and then you know during the dry periods they move out of the area so the 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 movement in and out was very much based on the weather not as much on the season it was more based on the era or the epoch so this um, this is the broader region but this is all volcanic rock see how um, porous it is Oh, that. I missed that before. That is right here next to our our little left. See, that's where the sun was. There's that petroglyph right there. Amazing. I think I see another one here. Oh, look at that. Okay, I gotta turn off my video. So I was talking about how this is very is volcanic rock. And just to take a close look at that, how many circles are there? One, two, and then a line, a couple of humps. Okay, noted. Um, while we walk to this next place, I'll tell you about the volcanic rock. Okay, so grandfather fire. 
is the first fire. It's the volcanic fire within the earth before the sun was even born. So when you come to a ceremonial site like this, and the reason this would be a ceremonial site related to fire and related to sun is because of the volcanic rock. Because this volcanic rock came up as the result of grandfather fire deep in the earth creation happens with grandfather fire so when we because the the sun requires grandfather fire to even exist um the two are often you know kind of conflated in some of these ceremonial situations so look at this this is about to be pretty cool see that up there when you're when you're coming across the landscape da -da 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 -da. i wonder where the ceremonial site is oh well first of all first thing you see is that You've got a concentric circle with rays, lots of squiggly lines, and like lightning-like things going on up there. Let's see if I can zoom in for you. I've been working on this iconography for a while, and it's Southwestern relationship to the greater Southwest at large. And I'm going to tell you my personal working hypothesis about this based on groups like the Weechul, who I've been studying for the last few years. Um, the Weechul have uninterrupted symbolic systems that they still know for, from the last couple thousands of years that they were never contacted by Europeans. And they have roots and connections and linguistics and trade and lineage and uh, religious customs in common with southwesterners who would have been here so i feel pretty conf confident to hypothesize that that concentric circle at the top with the rays out that is a form of um like okay the the english word for it is god's eye but in mexico and amongst the huichol it's called nirica and it's a portal it's a it's a symbolic portal and you would surround a portal like that, like that center place, like kind of like a mandala, you'd surround it with instructive imagery to the, um, the deity, <clears throat> the nature deity that you were trying to commune with. And the squiggly lines around that portal are in the, in the cut tradition that I'm drawing from, our snakes are water snakes, um, snakes of water. What the, the, the snake, the water snake is the water that runs deep underground. It's the primordial waters. And all of those would be water symbols surrounding it. And then that little circle off to the side would be like a representation of sun. So that, that one that's in the middle up there. You, I mean, in the archaic times in you know deep prehistory the sun wasn't represented with a circle with rays around it the sun was represented that way with like a it's just a circle um and the moon is something similar i'm trying to think if the moon has a dot in the middle or something i mean different culture groups i guess re represent it differently but anyway this is that's that's how i read that i'm not saying i'm right i'm saying that is my working hypothesis based on the research i've done so um there you have it Feel free to do your own research and come up with your own conclusions. And so then, right below that, we have more portals, more portals, more portals. Okay, we've already talked about the portals being a thing in common amongst the Euro Aztecans. And then we're gonna go into this portal. Excuse me, I gotta take out my backpack. And as we go deep into this one, we're passing into the underworld, aren't we? It's under our plane of existence underground and look what we see here this is amazing um all right so drawing on research by this wonderful uh scholar that i just absolutely hang on his every word he's done a lot of research into this image that he calls a pipette and the only reason he calls it that is because it looks like a uh, a lab pipette. <laughs> it's just a way to refer to the image. It in no way has any um, ethnic roots as a word pipette in any way. That's just what it's called for frame of reference. Anyway, 
what he's concluded by looking at how this image appears in so many contexts all throughout Mesoamerica, including the Southwest, is it's the tiered cosmos. I love this um, because it explains so much. So the tiered cosmos, there's in Mesoamerican culture, you've got the underworld, the middle world that we're in. Underworld is like we're at death and some darker energies are also creation of fire and water comes up from under there. A lot of creation stuff happens deep under in the underworld. Um, the middle world is, is where we live, the earthly plane. And then the, there's the upper world, the celestial plane, where it's sort of like a loftier ideas and, uh, you know, there's sky beings, um, certainly all the planets, celestial objects are in the upper world. So the tiered cosmos is this underworld to our plane. This one doesn't appear to have an upper world, you see. Um, so this is like an emergence idea of going from the underworld to the earthly plane. And I mean, I, I could probably go on and on about this, but if you look at the ball cords, um, the Olmec ball cords, you see... Um, they're shaped like this. This is the shape of the ball court. This is where the ball game, basically where soccer came from, but it was, it's played, it was played in, in the early, um, days in Mesoamerica as kind of like recreation of the creation story where, um, the underworld gods fought against the, um, creator twins, uh, this game where you had a hoop here and a hoop here and you had to try to get the, this rubber ball into the hoops um, without using your hands and just like soccer um, and they play it out and I, th I it's my understanding that in those days if you lost if you were if you're the team that lost you died because that's how the story plays out in the in the I guess you'd call it the mythology or you know this in the stories is the one who the the, the the characters who died in the story were defeated and the other one got to win and reign. So if the underworld gods won, they got to, you know, do their business. And if the creator twins, the hero twins won, then they got to, you know, go, come back to life, come back into the upper world. So there's a whole bunch going on with that. So let's just keep looking around. I will stop talking and show more pictures. No. sick of the sound of my voice yet I know I am <laughs> um, but I, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna zip around this complex here and um, just kind of take some pictures and show you what's here and do some de-stretch if there's pictographs which I know there are and um, and if I have anything worthwhile to say I'll open my mouth otherwise not but you know what I hear I hear cows see fresh cow pie. I'm hearing this cow out in the distance there somewhere making noise, so I'll let you know if I see him. But, you know, cows do like to recognize the solstice in their own special way. So, I've, like I told you before, I've already kind of scouted around here. I'm excited to show you what's here, so let's get here.
You know, this one looks like a big fire pit. Look at all that smoke stain. But, you know, like a long time ago, fire pit. Doesn't look recent at all. You know, some of these little niches up here in these rocks, they would have stored um, ceremonial objects. This place has long since been looted. But, um, and that would have been, you would have come here periodically to you know, do what you gotta do and some of the implements would already be here. Wow, that's natural, but look at it. Oh my God. <gasps> and you know what? I think that's another keyhole. Possibly. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Look at also, there's a lot of this darkness up here, which means there was probably fires built under here, but what's weird about it is that they weren't built against the wall to reflect the heat. It looks like the fire would have been, like, if this, is, if this isn't water stain coloring, um, the fire would have been out, like, underneath this overhang instead of up against the wall, which is kind of unusual. It's almost like, I mean, if, if this is fire, it's almost like the, the fire was built to intentionally not bother this, you know? So I've scrambled up to the heights, <coughs> dry throat. Uh, the ceremonial site we were just looking at is behind this huge boulder, um, you know, down there, but behind. And so I scrambled up here, la la la, because I saw this huge rock overhang. It looks so gorgeous and promising for um, maybe petroglyphs or something. I don't see any petroglyphs. It doesn't mean the space wasn't used, but it's not part of the, um, uh, symbolic complex, I guess. Um, maybe the rock itself is, but there aren't any images there. But you know what is there? A huge bird's nest. Isn't that cool? Maybe an eagle or some other large raptor? Is that the word you use for predator birds? Yeah. That even makes the site more special, especially if there's an eagle up there. The eagle, eagle is associated with the sun and with fire. So that's even better. That properly caps off our visit to this site. So please let me know in the comments, have you visited any solstice or um, equinox sites? If so, please tell me about it um, and you know what it was like and what you saw. And also please tell me if there's some, um, you know, what other kind of content you might want to see on the channel. And also, is there, do you have any questions about this site here that I, I visited today? Because um, I, I might know some more things about it that I just didn't have a chance to talk about. So um, let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, go on over to the Facebook group, Ancient Southwest, and that's where you can post pictures of your own travels or see pictures from other people's travels, videos, stuff like that. It's a really great network, and there's also people always looking for um, someone to travel with or go hiking with. So if you there's some place you want to go or you want to um, just see if somebody wants to go on a, a you know sojourn with you, 
post it over there because real there's really nice people and I met quite a few people in person from that group and so um, I I can attest that we've got good people over there um, what else going over to the blog ancient the ancient southwest.com um, and if you would like to support these travels and these videos, please head on over to my Etsy shop, which you can access through the ancientsouthwest.com. I, um, I make a lot of a Weechel native inspired art where I press tiny glass beads into beeswax and pine pitch in the traditional fashion and I make um, traditional uh, Weechel images, southwestern style images in uh, brightly colored beads and there's a lot of stuff over there and it, it's something I love to do it's a hobby of mine I get so much joy out of it and um, if you purchase that art it, it goes for you know towards the things I do on this channel the gas and whatever <laughs> so help me out there if you see something you like only if you see something you like if not move on but keep watching all right <laughs> um well thanks for joining in and we'll see you next time may the fire inside you continue to burn brightly happy solstice hoping the sun comes back longer and longer days you've been good i'm sure it will <laughs> there they are oh thank god they're running in the opposite direction i was worried they would charge me <laughs> Come in peace. That's okay, you guys stay over there. I'm smaller than you.